you had company, you know, in your home this summer where you've had to, like, take on some extra people and feed them? Have you noticed that when you're out of your routine on a vacation or, or having company in your home, especially if you've got extra people involved, if you've got extra family or extra friends, uh, the whole question about eating becomes constant. What are we doing for the next meal? And the next, and the next. And it seems like you hardly get one of those meals kind of knocked out and done up, and then you've got to be plotting for, okay, where are we having supper tonight? Or what am I going to fix? Or, yeah, it gets complicated. <laughs> it can be so much work. My dad is turning 90 in a week and a half. Do you think he needs a birthday party? Yes, I see some nodding. Y'all can, y'all can speak up when I ask questions. It's fine. <laughs> and which child do you think convenes the family for such an occasion? Yep, it would be me and ably assisted by my husband. <laughs> He's in the back there. <laughs> do we really? I asked myself this, thinking about this this big birthday coming up. I was like, do we really want to take on feeding the whole family? Or could we just maybe slide into a restaurant and get her done? (laughs) You know, um, it's so much work. It would be so much easier for us. But, but harder for my father to hear in a restaurant, harder for a the family to move around freely and just mix it up with each other, and somehow just not as loving as feeding everyone at our house. So that's what we'll be doing next Sunday. Taking on a hungry crowd, however big or small the crowd is, can be hard work even under the best of circumstances. And I want to stop a moment here and give a little caveat for this sermon. I'm going to talk a lot about feeding people, and I'm taking that part of the text very literally in the sermon today. But there's all different types of hunger and need in the world, and there's many, many activities that respond to these different types of hunger. So just remember food, but feel free to think beyond that too. Let it be a symbol. But it can be hard work to feed people under the best of circumstances. So I have sympathy for the disciples in the story from Mark today. They didn't have the best of circumstances. They really weren't even supposed to be faced with a hungry crowd. That was not supposed to be a problem for them. They were supposed to be alone with Jesus. Brian Tillman is going to tell you more about that part of the story next Sunday. But they were supposed to be in a deserted place and having some downtime with Jesus. But people had been flocking to Jesus. And when those people figured out where Jesus was heading at that moment with the disciples, Jesus and the disciples got in a boat, kind of went down shore from where they had been. But the people hot-footed it by land to the location and were basically lying in wait for Jesus to get there. So when he did, He had compassion for them. He had compassion for the people who were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them. The day stretched on, the hour grew late, and finally the disciples interrupted Jesus. Their own stomachs were probably growling by this point in the day and suggested they were trying to be helpful. You know, Jesus... It's late. People are getting hungry. We don't, you know, there's nothing here for them to eat. Why don't we send them away? They can go out into the surrounding area and the villages and get something to eat. And that way, I mean, they didn't say this, but, 
you know, they were thinking it. It's like, and that way we can relax a little bit. You know, they were looking for that moment when the company leaves <laughs> and goes home and you t let out that big sigh. But Jesus didn't see it that way. Instead, he said to his disciples, you give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. Pause with me here a moment. How do you know, I'm asking each of you, how do you know when you are a disciple of Jesus Christ? Is it when you join the church? Is it when you show up as you have this morning for worship? Is it when you fill out your pledge card? Is it when you join a Sunday school class or a UMW circle or a men's small group? Is it when you sign up for the great day of service? Is it all of above, all of the above? How do you really know when you're a disciple of Jesus Christ? Could it be it's when you hear Jesus saying to you, you give them something to eat. You give them something to eat, disciple. I've heard those words more than once in my life. Sometimes I've heard them with gladness, and sometimes I've heard them with reluctance and doubt, which I think is how the disciples heard them that afternoon. Johns Creek United Methodist Word Church has heard these words. You give them something to eat. Let me review with you some of the ways this congregation takes on feeding people. For many years, Johns Creek United Methodist Church has participated in Trinity Table Soup Kitchen in downtown Atlanta. They, we go, we serve a soup and sandwich lunch twice a year to homeless people, street people, and we do it, one, one of the days that we do this is Mother's Day. We signed on years ago for a day when it would be hard to get volunteers to give their time and their service. And every year, we have people on Mother's Day that are taking care of the hunger of people who really need a meal. About four years ago, this church began supporting a feeding center in Chapet, Guatemala in cooperation with Mission Guatemala, and the feeding center provides a nutritious lunch to 60 or more children in this rural part of Guatemala. It provides a daily lunch for them. A mission team we commissioned last Sunday is in Guatemala. They left yesterday, and one of the things they're working on is some uh, work on the kitchen where the feeding center is. So this is something that our church is, is very much behind. The church supports Nor Norcross Cooperative Ministry and North Fulton Community Charities by collecting food items for the food, their food pantries through the year. We have a United Methodist Women's uh, Circle called Meals That Heal, and that group uh, prepares meal and takes meals to uh, people and families where there is illness or provides um, needed food at a time of death for a family, they, they respond um, to the needs as they come up. And then, as, as you've already heard this morning, uh, we also are involved with a program called Stop Hunger Now. And on August 15th and 16th, we'll be hosting and supporting a meal packing event, along with other churches in the area. And when I say hosting and supporting, I mean we're giving money, we're asking all of you to give money to this effort, and we also are asking you to sign up to um, be the packers. I've done that. 
it's fun. It is so much fun, so you want to reserve those days. Our aim is to uh, go as far as we can towards packing 100,000 meals. And that, these meals will go to areas affected by war or disease or natural disasters where people have been displaced and where food, getting food, is a problem. Closer to home this summer, we've had church members, and this one's been flying under the radar a little bit, but we've had church members step up and participate in a United Methodist supported program called Smart Lunch, Smart Kids. Every Tuesday and Thursday since the end of the school year and all the way through the first week in August before the school year begins again, uh, groups from this church have been taking lunches uh, and games and, and just love to a neighborhood, uh, I think it's in Gwinnett County, um, and this is a neighborhood where many of the children qualify for a reduced price or even a free lunch when they're in school during the school year, but they're not getting that lunch during the summer maybe, and they may not be getting a lunch um, because they're not in school. So we go and we take lunches. I went Thursday and helped out. It was great fun. Just kind of a little microcosm picture of the scripture lesson because uh, blankets were laid out on the green grass under a shady tree and children, once they had their lunch, just gathered around and, and sat and had a little picnic. Um, and it was just wonderful to see um, some of the mothers and children from Johns Creek uh, enjoying and fellowshipping with these, these kids. There's one more Thursday that needs a sponsoring group. It's August 6th. So if you haven't participated or your group hasn't participated in the Smart Kids Smart Lunch program, see Brian Funderburg or see me after the service and we will get you connected to the disciples who have organized this program for the church this summer. Now that's probably not all this church is doing to feed people, but it's a strong list of responses to Jesus' instructions. You give them something to eat. Now if it sounds like I'm bragging on you, I am. It's great to be part of a church that undertakes these ministries, that sees the need and cares and wants to feed people. But don't let my bragging go to your head. Where we need to keep all of this is in our hearts. To keep facing into the hunger of the world, disciples like you and me must continually be open to hearing Jesus say, you give them something to eat. And then we must be willing to give what we have, despite whatever doubts and reluctance we may feel at first. Going back to the scripture, the disciples weren't too thrilled by Jesus' command. What? You want us to give them something to eat? Where are we going to get it? And even if we could, how could we possibly pay for it? 200 denarii to feed 5,000 people, that's like two-thirds of a, somebody's annual income back then. They didn't have that kind of money. This is where Jesus asked them for what they had instead of what they didn't have. Jesus asked them for what they had, not for what they didn't have. Nor did he ask them if they had any extra that they could spare. So it's not about extra, it's about what you have. How many loaves do you have? Go and see. The disciples were probably thinking, there goes our supper. Uh, five loaves and two fish was hardly enough for them. 
and certainly not enough for this crowd, but they gave it. The year Hal and I got married, 1979, the new Pope John Paul II made a trip to North America. Uh, he spoke to, um, among other places, he went to New York City where he spoke to the United Nations. And then he preached to a tremendous crowd at Yankee Stadium. And what he said on that occasion is still a word of teaching for us today. Listen to what he said. The poor of the United States and of the world are your brothers and sisters in Christ. You must never be content to leave them just the crumbs from your feast. You must take of your substance, and not just of your abundance, in order to help them. And you must treat them like guests at your family table. Take of your substance. As an American, middle class, employed, homeowning, you know, all those things that I am and so many of us are, if I just think about it in terms of dollars and cents, I don't know how much more I would have to give before I, my husband and I would be giving of our substance. We tithe. I don't know how much more I would have to give to get to giving of my substance monetarily. But I don't want you to hear that that monetary gift is the only one, or the only thing that we have. We have time. Some of these kinds of issues around hunger, they need more than a meal to be served. They need people to give time to look and see how maybe we can address some of the underlying causes, my husband would say root causes. What are the root causes of hunger? Talent. How do we give of ourselves in a way that's substantial? And I'm not going to say don't give of your abundance. Like, let's do that too, okay? We'll do, we'll do both. <laughs> The rest of the story is of the work, the miracle that Jesus did. He had those disciples organize smaller groups. He blessed the food, and he gave it to the disciples to distribute among the people, and all ate and were satisfied. All the people, the disciples, and Jesus. And there were leftovers, which is great. How do you know when you've witnessed a miracle? When you realize, this to me is it, how do you know when you've witnessed a miracle? When you realize you've been part or you've become part of something life-giving and satisfying that is more, much more, than the product of your own efforts. It's when you realize you have been an instrument in the hands of Christ to bring love, to bring joy, to bring healing, to bring forgiveness, to bring peace, to bring hope to someone or some people in need and yourself not least among them. My mother told me this story and I have... <laughs> I've told it a couple of times, I haven't been able to tell it without getting choked up, so bear with me. Last summer, some people from her church, which is Harmony Grove United Methodist Church in Lilburn, some of you who know the Carlton family know that this is, 
the church where Debbie Carlton is pastor. Uh, they began a ministry of bringing lunches to a neighborhood uh, close to the Lilburn Elementary School, much like what we are doing this summer. One of the Harmony Grove members is a teacher at the school. Towards the end of this school year, she was talking with her young students about summer coming up. She asked if there was anything that they remembered from last summer that had been really special for them, something they had done with their families or you know, something that had been special to them. And right away, one little boy's hand just shot up. Miss Sheila, Miss Sheila, I know, I know. Last summer, some people came to our neighborhood and brought lunches to us. And this was the first summer I had a lunch every day. It breaks my heart to think of a child not having lunch every day during the summer. Doesn't it break yours? But it makes me so glad that our churches care enough to take something on that takes time and effort and sweat and do what needs to be done. You know you've witnessed a miracle when you realize you've been an instrument in the hands of Christ to bring love and healing and forgiveness and hope and peace to a person or a family or a community in need. And in the process, you found love and healing and forgiveness and hope and peace in your own heart and in your own life and in your own soul too. It's hard work. It's hard work being a disciple, saying yes to Jesus when he says to you, you give them something to eat. But what better hope can we have than to see and experience Christ himself at work in our midst and one day to hear him say at the last, well done, good and faithful servant. <laughs>